they put me in a chair and they stood around and he addressed me and he said, look, do you want a career in science? I said, yes, I do. Well, he said, if you want a career in science in public in front of these witnesses, you deny your naive faith in God because I tell you something, if you carry on with this, you will be intellectually crippled. You'll never make it. You'll suffer by comparison with your peers. So here and now, give it up in public. Okay, John, thank you for coming to Houston. My pleasure to be in Houston. You know what interests me most of anything in the world? I think I do. <laughs> and it's not science. It's not science. It's the scriptures. It's yeah. the Bible. Tell me what it is that that made you, that really drew you to get excited about the scriptures? What well, was it was it? first of all, my parents. I grew up in Northern Ireland and my memories of my dad particularly, although my mum was, that <clears throat> dad was immersed in scripture. But he introduced me to it in such an expansive way that my first impression of scripture was it was mind expanding. It was mind opening. The idea that some people have that Bible believers are bigoted and narrow and all this would never have occurred to me because dad, he pointed me in the direction of all the dimensions that surround scripture. By that I mean he would get me interested in the historical background, in the archaeology, in the question of evidence. But above all, the thing that came through to me very early, and I don't know exactly when, was that this was true. And so the truth question for me is central. This is true. God speaks. I hear his voice in the word of God, and it makes sense of life. It gives me a compass bearing to live by, and it makes sense of everything else. So it's the big story, the meta narrative. And I learned that pretty early on. And my father kept feeding me with information so that when I got to college, I hit the ground running. So tell me about this, this mentor of yours, uh, uh, Dr. Gooding. What was his influence in, in regarding the scriptures? Well, at several levels. I, one thing I can remember very clearly was that there was a turning point. Dad made scripture interesting. But my father didn't have an advanced education. He wasn't allowed to have one. He had to run a small family business and so on. And when I was about 13 or 14, there arrived this young lecturer in Greek at Queen's University, Belfast. And my father went to listen to him and he came home and he said, John, you've got to come and listen to this man. So I went a bit reluctantly. But what I can remember very vividly is sitting at the back of a large conference by our standards, four or 500 people. And this man got up, he's 20 years older than me. And he said, why do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Pause. And then he said, perhaps because your parents told you, perhaps because your Sunday school teacher told you, but are there any other reasons to believe? And he says, I think there are. And he read to us John chapter 20. And he started mm. to logically set out all the different kinds of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And it was an electrifying moment for me. I remember thinking, this is what I need. Mm. This is so logical, it holds together. I'm going to get to know this stuff. And I hope I'm going to get to know this man. Yes. And I not only got to know him because my parents invited him home, I got to work with him. He mentored me for you know, about 50 to 60 years. So it was a very happy event that. The second big step was when I went to Cambridge and I was 19, my second year. And I was having difficulty with scripture. It wasn't the usual difficulty. A lot of people have difficulty with the Bible because they don't really believe it. I had difficulty because I believed it and found it boring. And I was enjoying philosophy. I did a, a minor in philosophy. And 
it worried me. Why, why wasn't Scripture more interesting? If this is really the Word of God and God speaks, why? So I got really concerned about it. And I was wandering around Cambridge. And David Gooding, in that year, was at Tyndale House, the famous Tyndale yes. Evangelical Library in Cambridge. And he was there on sabbatical. So I thought, perhaps I should go and talk to him. So I wandered around Cambridge trying to screw up enough courage to turn up at his door in Tyndale. Eventually got there, very tentatively knocked on his door. Come in. Oh, John, my boy. He's very English. And what can I do for you? And I said, David, I'm in trouble, real trouble. So I told him. And he looked at me for a moment and started to laugh, which isn't always the best way of helping a soul in distress. And I was quite put out. Oh, he said, I'm really sorry I'm laughing. He said, John, but you know, it's better to have this problem when you're 19 than when you're 59. Tell you what he said. I'm doing a Bible study starting tomorrow night with a farmer friend of mine who had no education. That was the stature of David Gooding. He was a genius at the level of C.S. Lewis, but he was doing a Bible study with a farmer and his wife. David Gooding never married. Would you like to come, he said to me. Oh, I said, I would spoil it. I couldn't. Well, he said, you know, the farmer's wife cooks a pretty good meal beforehand. OK, I'll come. <laughs> so I went. And i never forget that evening. He asked them, did they have any old wallpaper? I thought, wallpaper? Yes, they had wallpaper, a roll of wallpaper. He reversed it so the blank side, and he said, do you have any blue tack? Let's stick it on the walls of their lovely home. So he rolls up at the wall of the home. And then he said, now, uh, Matthew, what are you telling us? Gospel of Matthew. So he stood up, and it, it was a total enlightenment for me. It was the first time I'd ever seen somebody take the Bible intellectually seriously, from a literary perspective, first of all. How is this structured? How is it organized? And it only took one evening, and it completely convinced me that this is God speaking. Mm. Because what I learned to do that evening, I was studying maths, it's very exact, very precise, demands a lot of work to understand it. And I suddenly saw, I can take scripture just as seriously as I take my mathematics. That was a revelation and a revolution. And I learned from him. He then took me on to mentor me. But to establish whether this was real or not, unknown to him, I got a group of folks together in the university, all students, and I started doing this with them. Opening scripture, seeing what it's well, his main emphasis was on two big things. You look for its structure. A big book has structure. All literature has structure. But the thought flow, how does it carry the argument? Why is this story after that and not before it? How does it work? And he constantly asked the question, so what? So that he started with analyzing what it said before he got anywhere near what it meant. He said the biggest mistake people make with Scripture is they want to apply it instantly. And he says, you know, you can have instant food out of a can. You can have a tin of baked beans, but it's boring. If you want to have real food, you've got to do a lot of work and get the ingredients together. And it's the same with the Bible. You must spend a lot of time seeing exactly what it says before you ask what it means and how it applies. And he did that, and I did that. And students began to come around. And soon I was leading four or five Bible studies simultaneously in different colleges in Cambridge. And in a sense, I never looked back. And I started a big Bible study because I noticed that many students appeared to lose their faith when they left university because they never got into Scripture. Yes. They were brilliant at mathematics or chemistry or something like this, but Scripture remained at a childish level. And they get out into the workplace and people talk to them about what they believe and the discrepancy between their professional capacity and 
their knowledge of the Bible is so great, they come across as kids and they get silenced very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do something about that. So I had a three-hour serious session on Scripture on a Sunday afternoon. And the whole objective of it was to get into Scripture, not to prepare sermons, but to hear God speak. So you, you, there was an instance, I remember you telling me once, where some professors brought you in and, and uh, challenged you. You were brought before a group of professors and they pushed you on something and they, they wanted you to deny your faith. Oh, yes. Tell, yes. tell us that, that story. Happened, uh, that happened around the same time yes, I figured as I went to time. David Gooding. Yes. And uh, what actually happened was I was in my college. We had a nice dinner one night and I found myself sitting beside a Nobel Prize winner for chemistry. And I chatted to him. And in those days, I was happy to talk to anybody because I found asking questions much easier than answering them. And I played Socrates. So at one stage in the conversation, we were getting on fine. And I said, look, in your work that won you the Nobel Prize, did you ever think that there might be a mind behind the universe? And he got red. He got angry. No. And... It was disingenuous, you know, and that was the end of it. He turned to the neighbor as one does at these dinners, and I thought, that's it. I've blown it. But at the end of the meal, he said, Lennox, come to my room. And it wasn't an, an invitation. It was a command. So I went to his room, and to my great surprise, he'd invited a number of senior members of the university, three or four of them, plus the chaplain of the college. And... As I remember it, they put me in a chair and they stood round. And he addressed me and he said, look, do you want a career in science? I said, yes, I do, really. I'd like one. Well, he said, if you want a career in science, in public, in front of these witnesses, you deny your naive faith in God. Because I tell you something, if you carry on with this, you will be intellectually crippled. You'll never make it. You'll suffer by comparison with your peers. So here and now, give it up in public. Talk about pressure. Yes. 19 years old, Nobel Prize winner. Times are different now. Oh, they are. Well, it occurred to me even then yeah. afterwards that if he'd been a Christian and I'd been an atheist, he'd lost his job the next yes. day. Yes. It was browbeating. Of the, of the worst kind. Yes. So somewhere, I know from where, I got the courage to ask him a question. And I very quietly looked him straight in the eye. And I said, sir, what have you got to offer me that's better than what I've already got? And he said, the evolutionism est l'on vital of Émile Bergson. And I thought, wow. I knew about Émile Bergson from C.S. Lewis. I didn't know at the time, I wish I had, but it didn't matter, that late in life, Émile Bergson, who was Jewish, wanted to convert to Catholicism, but didn't because of some atrocities that the church had committed in the Second World War. But all I said to him was this, because I knew that Lewis had refuted it. I couldn't remember the arguments at the time. I said, if that's all you've got to offer me, I'll take the risk. I'll stay with Christ. Good night. And I got up and walked out. That was transformative. It yes. put steel into my heart. Yes. And I resolved a whole series of things. I was only 19. I was young. But I said, Lord, if I ever get an academic position, I will never do that. Use my authority in science to go way outside my field and browbeat somebody mm -hmm. regarding their worldview, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it taught me that there's an unacceptable side to academia. This wasn't science. Mm -hmm. This was his atheism coming through. Mm -hmm. And it was a good preparation for facing the likes of Professor Dawkins yes. and Christopher Hitchens and so on. I didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. But it was important, Jim, because... When you face that up, I do believe that God puts some kind of confidence into your heart mm -hmm. and 
coupling that which was facing outwards into the atheistic world helped me enormously in my confidence in Scripture. I'm going to stick with this, yes. but I'm going to learn how to explain it in such a way that even you, Nobel Prize winner, will understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the same age when I got saved at the age of 18. And when I was 19, I met Brother Bak Singh of India, mm -hmm. the prophet of India. And uh, he had started over 600 churches in India, a man of great faith. And his disciple, Dr. T. E. Koshi, who was my pastor, and he introduced me to Brother Bak Singh. And I saw a man with such confidence, such confidence to say, every word in the Bible is true. Every word. And I saw his life and the power that was there and the, the ability that was there that came through this, this constant being in the Word of God, how the two of those men taught me to take the Word of God, get on your knees, open and say, Lord, speak to me through this Word. Speak to me. Speak to me. And then you read and you let God begin to speak to you through the Word. Brother Boxing always used to say, God speaks. You read the scriptures, you would say, it says, God said, God speaks, God said, over and over and over again, God speaks through the scriptures. And I was a young man, just 19, just absorbing this. And to this day, I follow that pattern. Hmm? I get before the Word of God and I said, Lord, speak to me, speak to me, Lord, and when I'm preparing for a message, it's, you know, very little is just, is, is, is trying to read commentaries. It's just, Lord, what does this say? What does this say? Speak to me. I want to hear God's voice. You must have the same experience. Absolutely. And I learned this very early on. I remember having a discussion with David Gooding about this very thing. And he he put it in a rather angular way. He said, you know, some people only study the Bible to prepare sermons. And I said, isn't that a good idea? Oh, only study to prepare sermons. Sermons, yes. I see. And I said, but isn't that a good idea? Well, he said in his place, but why do you study it then? He said, to hear God speak. Mm -hmm. And that again was a turning point. Mm -hmm. That notion that as the Lord promised his disciples, that he would reveal himself to them by speaking through his word. And that for me, starting at roughly the same age as you, became the goal. In other words, I wanted to hear God speak. Mm -hmm. And then I would have something to say to other people, but only then. Mm -hmm. And it's been crucially important because I'm afraid that in our technologically very advanced age, there is a huge temptation for people to make do with stuff off the internet. And you know, Jim, that if you're listening to somebody try to expound scripture, you'll know in five minutes whether it's real or not. Mm. And the tragedy is it often isn't real. Yeah. You know, they scrape it off the internet. You can now get quite a good sermon written by chat GPT-4. Mm -hmm. um, which will answer some very good theological questions correctly. But there is no substitute for sitting before the Lord and saying, Lord, speak to me. Yes. So you're absolutely right. And sometimes one has to wait. And I really believe that uh, this might sound a bit strange, but our attitude the scripture has to become a matter of faith in the sense that do I trust the Lord enough to spend the time and wait on the Lord yes. for him to speak? And I noticed that in scripture, particularly in the Psalms, this refrain, wait on the Lord, and we're so impatient, especially mm -hmm. if you're Irish, you're really impatient. Wait on the Lord, wait and wait. And you know when he speaks. Do you find that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I even remember when I was 19, crying out to God, just weeping before him and saying, Lord, speak to me. I'm not hearing anything, Lord. Speak yeah, to me. Yeah. And then the word would just, yes. bow, just come alive. You know, Charles Spurgeon puts it this way. He says, you know, you know this is it. It's like, it's like the handshake 
of a good friend. Yes. You grab that hand. And to this day, this is what happens. I pour over the Word of God day after day. Lord, I'm not seeing anything here. Mm -hmm. This is the passage. What is it? And then all of a sudden, oh, there it is. Just like that. Boom! Mm -hmm. God does it. And what I fear is that so few people understand this. Yes. They, so few people understand this pouring out, Lord, what is it you want me to see here? And then he brings light. He brings light. And uh, I learned this at a young age. And, and if I don't have it, you know, if it's not there, I'm just crying out to God. Mm. Where is it, Lord? Mm. I want to hear you. God is so good. And he does speak through his word. But he does sometimes make you wait. It's very interesting. I asked my mentor once what had happened to him. Yes. How did he get into this. And he told me the following story. During the war, he was actually a conscientious objector. And they put him to work on a farm. And he did all the menial work, backbreaking work, mm -hmm. you know. And he was studying scripture. And he said, I was reading here and reading there and getting nowhere. I was getting nowhere. No voice, nothing. And he said, he came to a decision, right, I'm getting nowhere. So I might as well stick with one book and get nowhere, as go all over the Bible and get nowhere. Uh -huh. And he said, I turned to the Gospel of Luke and I started reading Luke. And one day he said, it was quite a while, suddenly I noticed that there was a deliberate sequence in three stories in Luke 5 and whomph. Yes. And he said, I have never looked at a book of scripture since. And that didn't happen. And he wrote a book about it, according to Luke, which was seminal in helping me book. understanding. Yes. Yes. And that kind of thing, it's, it's infectious because once you learn that it's real, that there's a supernatural dimension to this, God is prepared to reveal himself, you expect him to. Yes. And he's kind to us, he's good to us, and I'm often not as diligent as I should be. But there is that sense, and what it does, it does something that no amount of archaeological research, historical research, everything else research does. Yes. It convinces you of the inspiration of Scripture by Scripture itself. Yes. And he used to emphasize this, and I think this is hugely important. If the only evidence you have for the authenticity of the Word of God is the archaeological evidence for the establishing the text as authentic, mm. all of which is important, that's not enough. The real authentication of Scripture comes when you hear the voice of God speaking through it. And that's hugely important. Yes. It does claim to be the Word of God. And we read that, but we don't take it seriously. If it is, then you've got to be able to hear God speak. And you don't have to work that up. You know it when it happens. Yes. And then your whole capacity to communicate it changes because you've got confidence in it, because it is spoken. And that's what I aim for yes. in my writing and in my speaking. If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send me an email and give me a chance to tell you by Zoom why I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is, this is what I aim for. That if, if it, I say, Lord, I have nothing to give these students. I have nothing to teach them. Lord, teach me, yeah. instruct me. And, and then he begins to speak. Uh, you remember Nabil Qureshi? I do, yes. Very good friend of mine. He went off to Oxford, your institution, to study toward his PhD. And when he came back to Houston one day, he said, he said, Dr. Tour, would you mentor me? Would you, would you? I, I said, you know, I'm not a good mentor one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not good at this. He says, no, I, I really, he just kept coming back at me day after day asking me. I said, look, I come home from work every day. My kids are gone. They're all grown gone. It's just my wife and I. Just, just 
you can have dinner with us. You sit with us and I'll just talk to you. The first night he came over, I said, what have you been reading these days? And he was reading out of, out of uh, uh, the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses. And I said, w what's happening in your life through that? He said, well, you know, I'm just trying to figure out who wrote this. <laughs> I said, what do you mean who wrote it? Moses wrote it. He says, I said, who, what's, what's, who's been teaching you something at Harvard, at, at, at Oxford? What's, what, what's going on here? Then I took him to, to John's, the Gospel according to John, and Jesus said, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for Moses wrote of me. Moses wrote of me. What do you think Moses was writing? Jesus said, Moses wrote of me. He said, you know, I've not been hearing God at all. I said, of course, you're never going to hear God when you disbelieve his word like that. And right there in my kitchen, we got on our knees and, I, and he repented for not believing every word in the word of God. I have his text message still to this day. I've taken a picture of it. He said, God is speaking to me. This was that, that same night. He says, mm -hmm. God is speaking to me like when I was a first a believer. Mm -hmm. He said, this is so good. God is speaking to me again. I said, yes, if you disbelieve anything in the Word of God, if you think that this is not from God, you, God's voice is closed off. You take hold of the fact that God, this is God's Word. God has written this book. Every word in Scripture is good and right and from God. And then it will start to open. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it just came back. I didn't want him to go to, off to Oxford again. <laughs> well... I have experienced this a lot. When I was a student at Cambridge, there was a huge ferment in the theological world. It was called the Honest to God debate. And many bright young Christians who were studying the sciences maybe, or languages or history, decided that the best way to serve their generation as believers was to stop doing their sciences and enroll for at least a year in the theology faculty. Now, some made it because they could cope with the stuff that they were being served with and they could meet it. But others, their study took them much further away from God than they were to start with. And in that sense, they were useless to the church. And I remember a missionary saying to me years ago about this kind of theological liberalism. He said, you know, John, you can't drink poison all that time and it not affect you. And that's the tragedy of liberalism and the idea that scholarship means undermining the authority of God and the reliability and the fact that Scripture is God-breathed. That, to my mind, is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And when Christ warns us through his apostles not to be many teachers, and he warns people against undermining the word of God and teaching falsehood. It is a fearful thing to do this, because to take a young person who's gifted, who's keen on serving the Lord and committed, and to undermine them theologically so that they lose any grip of God speaking, mm. I think the result of that's going to be fearful in the judgment, frankly. And thank God for genuine theologians who understand the stuff and can write above it and keep faith. We need those people. Yes. We need those scholars. And there are quite a number of them who have resisted this temptation, often at quite a considerable price. Mm. But it's awful when you see that kind of effect that you noticed. I've seen it in many people. Yes. And it's very hard to get back on track. You mentioned repentance. We have to repent mm -hmm. and change our minds. Mm -hmm. And when God begins to speak again in his mercy, then that's utterly transformative. Yes. But we so need a generation of young people who learn what I call electronic fasting. I often say, people say, but I haven't time to get into scripture like this and spend time with God. And I say, right, when you, when this is over, sit down and write down how much time you spent in the last week playing with electronic 
instruments, tablets, smartphones, computers, on topics that have nothing to do with either your work or your Christianity, gaming and all this kind of thing, and then come back and tell me you've no time. Mm. People spend time on what they love, mm. and that is a very telling thing. If they're spending, as many people do, four or five hours a day using these devices to no real purpose, well, it shows their values. And it's clear that they're not putting God first. And they're never going to get anywhere until they repent of that and change. So I say to people, practice a bit of electronic fasting. It's interesting. You know, when I, <laughs> what I learned from Brother Bach Singh is that, you know, he was an old man when he would come and we would take turns as, as college students to stay in the room with him, to, you know, to help him to, if he had to use the bathroom at night or something. That man used to pray. He would get up in the middle of the night and just kneel by his bedside for an hour, for two hours, just kneeling by his bedside and praying. Prayer. Yes, and yes, I would I see this. This is so foreign, <clears throat> so foreign a concept today. And it was from him I learned about rising in the morning early. To this day, I'm up before three thirty to spend wow. time with the Lord, and I love it. I mean, this is my life to do this. M Moses wrote. Moses is the one who wrote. This word that I'm warning you about, this is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. The scriptures are, your, are our life. Moses said, this word that I've given you, after 40 years of instruction, he's summarizing this in Deuteronomy mm -hmm. 32. 40, how do you summarize 40 years of instruction? That's like, that's like, like, like 10 PhDs. Yes. How do you summarize? He said, the word that I've given you, it's not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. Mm -hmm. And it is by this word that you're going to go into the land and take this land. It's by the word of God. The scriptures are so powerful. And I see so many young people lose their life because they have no power from the word of God. Mm -hmm. The treasure of the scriptures is so real to be able to take the scriptures and, and pull life from the scriptures to pour over the Word of God and say, Lord, speak to me through this passage. Speak to me. So many times I go into my prayer time and I feel like ah, there's no way I'm going to accomplish all that I have to do today. Mm. And I just cut, leave that time and I'm like a roaring lion. Just told, I'm ready. I'm ready for the day. Yeah. I am ready for the day. Because He strengthens us. He gives us this amazing power. God lives. He lives. His Word is true. Every word in the Bible is true. I had a colleague, m much like we were talking about, I had a colleague at Rice. Uh, um, uh, some students told me they, they, they think this, this professor in the religion department is a Christian. I said, I'll, I'll find out. So I had him over to the faculty club for lunch. We sat down. I said, do you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? He said, a physical? He said, maybe not. I said, well, tell me your story. He said, well, I was, I was, a, um, I was actually a Baptist evangelist. He said, I went to Harvard Divinity School. I said, oh, stop right there. I know what happened. You went into Harvard believing in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you came out of Harvard Divinity School not believing, right? He said, I guess that was the beginning of it, yes. And this is what I'm talking about, that we can't lose this no. passion and this fire daily in the Word of God, daily in the Word of God. And so when I share with people the Word of God, I say, talk about every day from the rest of your life, from today, you're in the Word of God yeah. every day. Yeah. Let me bring you back to Bhakt Singh. I never met yes. him. But he had a profound influence on George Verwer, who started... Operation Mobilization. Yes. Just before I went to Cambridge, I heard of this. And a missionary, a Japanese missionary, challenged me and my best friend, who was very bright, older than me. We met him on the seashore at the beach, and it was a remarkable encounter. I said, that's Bobby Wright. He's a missionary to Japan. Mm -hmm. And my friend said, let's go and talk to him about Japanese philosophy. So we cheeky young men at the age of 17, he must have been 18, 19, went to Bobby. And Bobby invited us home. 
And he and his wife, we talked, and we talked till four o'clock in the morning. Never forget it. And his wife sat there, said nothing. We discovered later to our great embarrassment, she had a first class degree in mathematics and all of this. And he was an amazing missionary, decorated by the Japanese government for his work in prisons, always financed himself, set up a pharmacy, ran it, and that funded his work. So he said, boys, he had a funny squeaky voice, come back tomorrow. So we went another. And we just hadn't a care that the man had to work the next day. On the fourth night, he said, now, boys, you're going to listen to me. You're a bright pair of lads, but there's something missing. And our hearts fell. <laughs> he said, you're doing nothing for the Lord, and I'm going to change that. Now, he said, next Monday night, you two are going to run a tent mission in the village of so-and-so. Oh, we were devastated. And he set it all up. He said, you need to get doing something if you really believe these things. We were petrified. And I said, is there anything else we can do? I, I was terrified of doing a tent mission. I said, look, I've heard of this organization called Operation Mobilization. What do they do? He was a bit skeptical. But I said, there is a conference in a couple of weeks' time. Well, he said, OK, I'll give you a choice. I'll give this the benefit of the doubt. Either you're running the tent mission or you're an OM. Mm -hmm. So I was so terrified of the tent mission, I went to OM and was sent to Austria. And it was first my first experience. It was very primitive. We took Bibles and books. But I started witnessing. I then went to Cambridge. And because it had been such an experience for me, I sought out one other person who'd done the same thing in another country. And we said, we need a prayer meeting. Because those were the days in which Cambridge, the Christian students really were into prayer for all kinds of things. There's OM prayer meetings, there's prayer meetings for the, for the Sudan mission, all this kind of thing, you see. So I started the OM prayer meeting and it grew and it grew and it grew until 40 or 50 people. And then they got involved in my Bible study that I ran. But the whole point was to get on with Bible evangelism and not simply getting into Scripture. In other words, you needed an outlet. Yes. And that was hugely important for me because seeing that God could work in the lives of other students and in particular change their worldview, that was crucial for me, Jim, because brought up in Ireland where folk believe, well, everybody's a Christian there and they fight about it. You know, it's, it's meaningless. It was very important for me to know by experience that my Christianity was not a function of my genetic constitution <laughs> or my yes. environment and background, that it was real and true. And so I would put beside all this, and I'm sure you would because you're an evangelist par excellence. It's not only getting into the scriptures, it's getting those scriptures out yes. with confidence to the people around you, yes. isn't it? It is. I, you know, I was 19. I moved into the discipleship house that Dr. T.E. Koshi had set up. And, and again, he, he was mentored by Brother Bok Singh. And uh, in this discipleship house, we would have Friday night prayer meetings. Yeah. So you had these college guys, and a lot of things are going on on a Friday night on campus, mm. but we were in prayer meeting. Yeah. We were in prayer meeting. And, uh, and in fact, Shireen, my wife, used to come to the prayer meeting. That's where I saw, that's where I saw that she's a, she really loves the Lord. She would show up on Friday nights to the prayer yeah. meetings. And so we'd be in prayer meeting, and then one night a week, we had to do door-to-door -door evangelism. <laughs> they said, okay, boys, we're, we're doing door-to-door -door evangelism. Two by two, you're going door-to-door. Your neighbors, not taking you to a different city. Yes. It's your next door neighbors. You're going right down the... Yeah. And we would go two by two. And Were you terrified? Oh, yeah, I was terrified. What am I going to say? Yeah. And I'd say, you, you know, we're here to talk with you about Jesus Christ. And I'd had a lot of doors slammed in my face, and some people would talk. 
But I did it over and over again, week after week, so that when I went to graduate school, I told a bunch of college guys, I said, we're going to do evangelism. We're going to do evangelism. And we went door to door. I knocked on every non-university housing complex around the university over my time in yeah. graduate school wow. because we weren't allowed to go door to door yeah. in the university housing complex. But I, I went door to door and when we were, we'd go two by two and when we had an odd number, I would go alone to the student center and I would just walk up to people and talk to them. And, and I remember I walked up to one professor who was sitting there working at one of the tables and I said, uh, hi, my name is Jim Tour. Can I talk to you about Jesus Christ? That guy was livid. I mean, he just went ballistic. And I'm like, I just asked you, you want to talk about Jesus? What's wrong with you? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about OM, which is my indirect about thing, but it was very funny. We were in Austria, and my German wasn't fluent then. It is now, but it wasn't. And we had a set of phrases we learned. And uh, one of the phrases had to do with Jehovah's Witnesses because they had been very active in this area. And mm -hmm. so inevitably, people would, after a bit of conversation, they'd say, you're a Jehovah's Witness. No, I'm not, you see, and you have to. So I was getting fed up with this. And I thought, these people have had such an influence in this place. Perhaps I ought to reverse the order of the presentation. So the next door I went to, I knocked the door and I said, Ich bin kein Zeuge Jehovas. I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. And the man looked at me and said, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, come in, we just stood and we laughed. And I had the best conversation of the day. So... I think the Lord sometimes has a real sense of humor. Yes. But you know, that influence, George Verwer just died recently. Yes. He was by far the most effective in stimulating young people into mission the world has ever seen. He uh, set up those ships, you know, yes. the Logos, the Doulos yes. and all of this, and getting Christian literature out. He was prodigious. It was yeah. absolutely incredible. Died just I recently. See. So getting into the word, getting into evangelism and keeping the two together. Yes. A missionary spirit, a studying Bible spirit. So teaching scripture was not the only thing I did and it's certainly not the only thing you do because the evangelism side is hugely yeah, important. Yeah, and I, I can't watch my fellow human <clears throat> beings, my... I can't watch them go to hell. No. I mean, how could I not speak up? Yeah. I can't just watch them go to hell. I remember, um, you know, Watchman Nee. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. I don't remember exactly how he said it, but it was something like, if a young person who gets saved doesn't share the gospel within a year, they probably never will. I think that's right. Yeah. I, I think that's right. And... There's such a culture today that it's very different from my day. I, I didn't have to contend with all this political correctness, council culture, victim culture, and all the yes. rest of it. And it seems to me, both from scripture and experience, that fear paralyzes many people. Yes. And I'm very encouraged in scripture by the fact that the man who teaches us always to be ready to give a defense, an apologia, to anyone who asks us a reason, logos, interestingly, concerning the hope that is within us, is Peter. And he was afraid. When the girl yeah. just outside Jesus' trial said, you were with Jesus, and he said, no, he got panic-stricken. And he's a good man to teach us about fear. And the interesting thing is, those verses that I've just quoted are often quoted. Always be ready. But the context is, just a couple of verses before, do not fear. Mm. Don't be afraid like they are. And that moved me so much because this is the big barrier for young Christians. Yes. They're scared like you were, going door to door, like yes. I was doing the same thing. And by the way, my wife Sally was going door to door before I met her as a 16-year-old because her father was an evangelist. He mm. wasn't, a, I mean, he had a job. He was a, a surveyor, 
But he would go door to door, one on one. He wasn't yeah. a public man at all. So that was another thing, like your Shireen, very yes. similar yes. Uh, kind of thing. So this is this is hugely important, it seems to me, that we overcome the fear barrier. There are two barriers, I think, Jim, and I'm sure, well, maybe you don't agree, but fear and shame. Mm. And I recently, I talked about this such a lot that I wrote it down. I've got a little book called Have No Fear. And it's really to help people through that barrier to the wonder of them experiencing the first time they lead someone to the Lord. Yes. You know, the scriptures empower us when oh, we spend do. time in the Lord. Lord, help me. I mean, we cry out to God. And you know, what happens is go figure, God answers prayer. <laughs> he answers prayer. He helps us. He helps us along and, and we share. And uh, um, I love to share the Word of God. And it was all from those early days, yeah. all from those early days. And by the way, I asked Brother Bok Singh, have you ever been to seminary? You know what he said? One day, <laughs> one day, and I left and I never went back. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I get asked the same question, and uh, my answer is slightly different. Oh, I visit seminaries all the time, <laughs> but I'm there to teach them yeah. scripture. It's sad, actually, and that, that really goes back to what we said before, that Seminaries, it seems to me, and I, I've never been formally to seminary. I have no formal theological training. I've had a lot of informal uh, training, and I've been very fortunate because my mentor was theologically very astute, and he was a world authority on the Septuagint mm -hmm. and a classicist. So I had a public education in maths and science and a private education in all this other stuff, and that was wonderful. But the danger is that people get separated from ordinary life and they spend years studying what they call theology and so on. And when they come back to the church, often they're not really into scripture. I, I talk to theology students all the time and I face them to this question, how much actual scripture do you get? And they say, what do you mean? Well, I said, you're doing theology, but theology is not necessarily scripture. There can, can be an awful lot of philosophy, and that's all good in this place. But how much are you exposed to the power and authority of scripture? And it's often tragic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you take the New Testament. This changes lives. And I tell students, look, if you guys are in the scriptures every day, every day, there's there's... Over and over again, it talks about the blessing if we're in the scriptures every day. Yeah. It's not for three days a week. There's no blessing. No. Nor are meals, blessing. you know. I often say to people, tell yeah. me. What um, if you only ate three yes, times a week? Yes, that's yes. exactly right. Yeah, yeah. How would you feel? And, and in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, in Psalm 112, verse 1 and 2, in Psalm 1, in, in Psalm 9, 119, 97 through 100, over and over again, it talks about the blessings that come if you're in the scriptures every day. And I say, if you guys are in the scriptures every day, I'm done. I know you're going to be okay in life. You're going to be okay in life if you are in the scriptures every day. If you're not, the world's going to beat you up. Yeah. But if you're in the scriptures every day, you're going to be all right. There's something to be added to that, I think. Now, I'm sitting here with you in the United States, and I, I don't know what the cultural norms are here. But I'm surprised still, and so is my wife, at the number of Christian men in the UK who do not pray or read scripture with their wives. They do it, but on their own. And, uh, you know, the, the strength, I believe, of a marriage, a Christian marriage, is, is a triangle. You know, when I marry people, which is very rare, but I have done one or two, I present them always with a musical instrument. It's the cheapest musical instrument in existence. It's a triangle. Uh. And I say, look, here we are. The Lord's at the peak, you and your spouse. Okay, hang this up in your house. And the first time you feel there's trouble, go ding, <laughs> ding. And there's several people around the world who've got this up. But I say the hugely important thing is 
when you're looking for a spouse, that you make sure she shares your mm -hmm. commitment to Christ or else there'll be trouble. But there'll be trouble even if your spouse shares your commitment to Christ if you don't share it together. Mm. I don't know what your take on that is. Oh, yeah. I love to pray with my wife. I don't like her to leave the home if, if she hasn't pray, if we no, haven't no, prayed. No, no, no. No, no. We have right, to pray together. I grab her and say, no, you're not going to go. We're going to pray. Yes, yes, she yes. She stops. And, yeah. And we're going to pray. We're going to spend some time in prayer together. And then when our children are going through something. Oh, yes. We gather. Oh, the absolutely. The two of us gather yeah, and yeah. pray for them. And they're grown. Yes, but sure. They, you know, you never stop being a parent. No. And, uh, and we're interceding on behalf of our but children. But is that a phenomenon here? That, that you find that men don't pray, or do they normally pray with their wives? Oh, you'd have to ask the pastor. He sees okay. more of this, but, okay. but uh, I, yeah. I, I'm sure it's a problem here. Yeah. John, this has been terrific. I, you know, I am so glad that you have, you have mentored so many people, even, even through your messages, through your books, through your YouTube videos, and uh, it's been a blessing to me and to so many others. You know, isn't it amazing? You, you growing up over there and me over here, even we're, we're not of exactly the same generation. You're about 14 years or 16 years older than me. But um, the commonality that we have in the Word of God and how God speaks and the treasure of the Word of God. And you and I have seen the same sort of things when these things are neglected, when these things aren't taken seriously, what happens in the lives of men and women. And then when it's taken seriously, the outcome of that as the scriptures say it over and over again, don't do this, do this, and this will be the outcome. That's right. And you yes. are evidence to me that Christianity is true. Amen. Glory to Jesus. He Amen. is the best, the best, the best in every yeah. way. <laughs> it's all because of Jesus. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jim. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button, and that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, it's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work, and if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you. Thank you.